Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here in ICTP to give a course on Hessians and life science properties. My name is Rodrigo Gondim. I'm from Universidade Federal Rural de Pernambuco. And this is my course plan. In the first lecture, I recall the classical work about hypersurfaces with vanishing Hessian, which a classical subject in algebraic geometry and also in commutative algebra. In the second lecture, I recall the structure of Artin and Bornstein algebras and link with the left set's properties. In the third lecture, I introduce higher Hessians and link with the classical work of Bordenutter to study left set's properties from the viewpoint of a Kalimatlis duality. And in the fourth lecture, I recall uh, how Hessians can be used to compute the Jordan types for Artinian Gornstein algebras, which is a way to measure how deep the algebra fails uh, the left set properties. So this is my course plan. And in the first lecture, I recall the classical work <clears throat> of Gordon Etter about hypersurface with finishing Hessian. So the aim of this lecture is to recall classical results and instructions about hypersurfaces with vanishing Hessian. The main work is in Gordon Ether uh, paper from the end of the 19th century. But after that, Perazzo and Permuti in the beginning of the 20th century uh, have lots of results in this direction. In the last decade, some of this classical work was revisited by Chiliberto, Russo, Sinis, Garbagnati, Repeto, Lossen, myself, Russo, Watanab, De Bond, and others. A modern reference about this first lecture is the chapter seven of Russo's book. Um, let me start with some motivation. Um, Gauss, in his classical paper on curvature of surfaces, he calculates, he computes the, the what nowadays we call Gaussian curvature of an implicit surface. He did it locally, but we also for implicit surface. Uh, and this formula of curvature for an implicit surface contains hidden in the formula a Hessian determinant. In the end of the paper, he also made uh, a discussion about local properties of surface with zero curvature. And locally, they must be one of these three. In R3, zero curvature. Locally, it's a cylinder or a cone or the developable tangent surface of a curve in R3. It's not a global classification. What he shows was that a surf, a local, locally a surface with zero curvature is a piece as a part of a cylinder cone or the tangent 
of a, a, a curve. I don't know what's going on. It's not working. Uh, if if the problem persists, okay, okay, that's okay. But if we consider the surface as an algebraic surface in the complex projective space P3 and the change the hypothesis of zero curvature uh, to the developability of the surface, which means that the surface is a rounded surface, but moreover, the tangent, the tangent space along uh, a straight line is constant, so the, the chaos map is generated. And then in this context, Benjamino Segre proved that uh, a projective a projective surface is developable if and only if it is a projective cone. Or the tangent surface of a non non degenerated curve <clears throat> in D three. He also give a uh, uh, um, uh, criterion of developability, which okay. The Hessian of F is zero, not F. In general, we can define the Hessian for any um, homogeneous form. I'm going to be interested in reduced hypersurface. In, as a matter of fact, I'll be more interested in irreducible uh, uh, hypersurface. And I'll call uh, has with capital letter H the Hessian matrix. And small h has the Hessian determinant. The name. Oh, what's going on? Now I just don't know how to fix it. Oh, it's okay. The name uh, is after Hess that proved a, a wrong claim, that did prove, uh, made a wrong claim. And perhaps it was motivated by the fact that in P3, a cone has vanishing Hessian and the tangent of this tangent of a curve has no vanishing Hessian. And so, 
one can suspect that it inspires Hess's claim that um, irreducible homogeneous polynomial has vanished in Hessian. No, I'm not saying that the Hessian is zero mod F. I'm saying that ever zero actually. If and only if up to projective transformation, F does not depend on all the, the variables, which is equivalent to say that F, or more precisely, the hypersurface defined by F is a cone. And in fact, and has give two wrong proofs of this claim. And um, in the end, in the last decade of, or something like that, of the 19th century. And the, the, the work of Gordon later is to fix the claim and understand the, the difference between cones and vanishing hash in general. It's true in P3, but it's not true in general. So let us recall what I'm saying. It's what's the projective cone. Let me introduce some notation for any subset of the projective space. I would note uh, this way, the linear span of S in the projective space. And I will say that the set S is degenerated if its linear span uh, uh, it's not the whole uh, projective space. So it's containing some, some hyperplane in the projective space. By abuse of notation, I will use this notation to denote the line through two different points, P and Q. And the vertex of a projective variety, if the set of points P in the variety, such that the line through P and Q is inside X for all Q in X. And I'm going to say that a projective variety is a cone if its vertex set is non empty. It's easy to see that in this case, the vertex is actually um, a linear a linear subspace of the projective space. I'm not insisting in this. I'll be more interested in understanding what is a projective a, 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 a project hypersurface to be a cone. And these are the equivalent conditions. It's a very easy exercise. That the, 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 if the previous definition, it's a cone if and only if there exists a point of multiplicity D, just take any point in the vertex. Uh, and of course, if I, if I write the point if you have choose up to projective transformation the point to be one zero 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 zero, it's easy to, to see that the, the, the fourth condition that F does not depend in this variable X zero, which is equivalent to, to say now result taken projective, projective transformation that the partial derivatives are linearly dependent and also this condition using the dual of the hypersurface x is a cone if and only if the dual is degenerated so its linear span is contained in, in a hyperplane in the projective space i will consider it in the dual projective space of course Cones form a trivial class of hypersurfaces with vanishing Hessian. 
because uh, the the Hessian matrix is contravariant up to linear change of coordinates, and its determinant does not depend on it. And after a, a linear change of coordinates, I can choose f not depending the variable x zero. So I will take the derivative with respect to x zero. It's zero. Therefore, there is a, a null a row and column in the Hessian matrix, which obviously implies that the, 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 the Hessian is vanished. But the converse is not true. That's the point. For this reason, we say that the Hess, Hess's claim is wrong. Of course, in degree two, the converse is true. It's a basic fact from basic linear algebra that the quadric, the matrix of the quadric is essentially the, the Hessian. So the, the, the quadric is a cone. It, the Hessian is degenerated. for d greater than or equal to three, it's not true in general. And in fact, there are counterexamples in any degree d greater than or equal to three and ambient dimension in, in greater than or equal, equal to four, as we will see in the sequel in P3. It's true. To understand the geometry of hypersurface with vanishing Hessian, it's important to understand the, the geometry of the so called polar map, also called gradient map. Let me introduce the polar map of a hypersurface. The polar map gradient map of hypersurface is a rational map given by the partial derivatives of the form. And I will call Z to be its image. So we have this picture. The following image and it's possible that the polar map is dominant, so the polar image is all the projective space, but in some case we will see that the polar image is that the polar map is not dominant. So I'm interested in this case and the base locus of the polar map is the singular locus of the hypersurface and I'll call it sing to conserve when I'm interested in the schematic structure and uh, if I'm only interested in the theoretic physical reduced part of the <laughs> of the singular logs, I call it Y. The easiest counter example to Hess's claim is the so-called Perazzo polynomial. It was explicit posed by Perazzo and in his paper, he called it un esempio semplicissimo. We'll see why it's so easy. Here, on purpose, I'm using like a uh, um, separation of variables, is x, y, and z appear minor 
in the polynomial f and the uv here appears feeling like quadrix. So it's a degree three polynomial. In fact, that adds to hypersurface is a cubic hypersurface. Is it reduced to cubic hypersurface before? I'm going to explain this example in details just uh, in a couple of minutes. The key point to construct such counter examples is to understand that the vanishing of the Hessian is equivalent to the known dominance of the polar map. So what I'm saying is that it's equivalent The algebraic dependence among the partial derivatives of f. I recall that x is a projective cone if the partial derivatives of f are linearly dependent but the vanishing of the Hessian is equivalent to the algebraic dependence among the partial derivatives. This proposition was simply used many times by Gordon Luther and also by Perazzo and Permuti. And nowadays we refer to Gordon Luther criterion. The first part is what we all just a few slides ago that it's a cone if and only if the partial derivatives of f are linearly dependent which of course is equivalent to z the polar image to be degenerated in other words z is contained in a hyperplane Easy to see because if there is some relation among the partial derivatives, linear re relation implies that Z belongs to this hyperplane. It's equivalent to Z to be degenerated. On the other hand, the vanishing of the hash is equivalent to Z to, Z to be to be. Contained in a hypersurface, not in, not necessarily in a hyperplane, because it's just an idea of the proof. I'm not going to the details, but the Jacobian of the polar map, since the polar is given by the partial derivatives, when we take the Jacobian. Just the hash. So the dimension of the polar map by the Jacobian criterion is the rank of the hash minus one. In particular, 
The Hessian is vanishing if only if this rank is not n plus one, so it's strictly it's less than or equal to n. So has zero if I believe this is less than or equal to n, then the polar map is not dominant, which is equivalent to say that there is uh, uh, an algebraic relation of dependence among the, the partial derivatives of f. Let me go back to Perazzo. To Perazzo. Example. Let me compute the partial derivatives. It's easy to see that there is uh, an algebraic relation among these derivatives of y, of e, that's it. All the derivatives are algebra dependent, which implies of f zero. But in the other side, if I compute the other partial derivatives, it's easy to see that they are not linearly dependent They are, they are linearly independent. X is not a cone. So this is the first counter example to has this claim. And it's really, really easy. For this reason, Perazzo talk un esempio semplicissimo. Gordon Elton also proved that the Hess claim is true up to P3. We saw that cones have vanishing Hessian, it's trivial. So we are interested in the covers. So if n is less than or equal to three, vanishing Hessian implies that x a cone. It's very, very interesting to think about this uh, condition, because what we are saying is that uh, up to P3, if there is an, an algebraic relation among the partial derivatives of a form, then this relation is a linear, a linear relation. It's a very strong claim. And it's very unexpected, but it's true up to P3. In the same paper, Gordon Etter produced a series of counterexamples to has claim in every dimension n 
greater than or equal to four, and every degree d greater than or equal to three, always using this, um, this which we call the coordinator criterion. The vanishing of Hessian is equivalent to algebraic, algebraic dependency among the partial derivatives. This is the main idea. But they are very interesting in construct lots of such, such examples in order to try to classify all the counterexamples. So they define the series of families of forms of Venetian Hessian. But just to begin, let me prove that actually there is, there are uh, counterexamples in any degree and any any degree greater than or equal to three and any dimension. Let me, construct, let me construct a very easy family, which is part of what we call Perazzo hypersurfaces. But they are not um, rich enough to give a classification of form with vanishing Hessian. But it is an easy proof of coordinate proposition that there are counterexamples in any degree and any dimension. I'm, I'm going to, to construct two very, very easy families just to start. If the degree D is odd, let me say 2K plus 1 greater than or equal 3, that F B X. K, Y, K, K, Z, B to K, and I'll put whatever you want with other variables. I'm assuming that A is greater than or equal to 4. It's enough to, to prove that here there is an algebraic relation of dependence among the partial derivatives, and it's easy to see. Great. Again, this product. There is an um, algebraic relation among the derivatives, which implies that the Hessian is vanishing. And it's easy to compute all the other derivatives and see that they are linearly independent. So the, the hypersurface defined by F is not a cone. If the degree is all is even, let me take F to be Okay. 
todo. Ok. And if you want to take uh, all the variables up to five, you can put anything you want in the other variables. Now, this is limited fx to k1, fy. Okay, just then if you put to k and then again fx fz is equal to fy square. So the Hessian is vanishing. Again, computing the other partial derivatives, it's easy to see that the, 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 they are uh, linearly dependent. Therefore, the hypersurface defined by f is, is not a cone and it has vanishing Hessian. It's an easy proof, but actually it doesn't capture the idea of coordinator to construct more general uh, uh, examples because they are interested in, in finding classification of oops, the classification of all hypersurfaces with vanishing Hessian in low dimension. Low dimension is actually in P4, to be more precise. The classification of hypersurface with vanishing hash in P5 is open in degree greater than or equal to four. In degree three, they were essentially classified by Perazzo, uh, which is small, problems in the proofs and revisited by myself and Russo. Let me recall what we call Perazzo hypersurfaces. In fact, I would like to recall the constructions of coordinator permuting Perazzo just from the algebraic viewpoint to give a clue how to try to prove these, these classification results. A Perazzo hypersurface is just something like that. We see that we need to, to, to make this separation of variables, we need at least three variables x and at least two variables of kind u. So at least five variables. For this reason, this, uh, the, this trick just, just came down uh, in, in P4, up to, uh, uh, from P4 uh, in Pn for a greater than or equal four. So, if we choose a separation of variables with n plus one variables x and n variables u, a perhaps hypersurface is something like that, linear in the variables x multiplied by a degree t minus one form in the variables u, and after that, if we want, we can sum some age, which depends only on the other variables u. With the hypothesis that the forms d in the variables u are algebraically depend, dependent, 
but linearly independent. Under this hypothesis, it is easy to prove that Parazzo hypersurfaces are not cones and have an issue in Hessian. It's just an easy computation of partial derivatives with respect to one of the variables x left in right. This way, and these guys are algebraically algebraically dependent. of f is vanishing but since they are linearly independent it's quite easy computation to prove that a x is not a home Actually, I use this kind of idea to find counterexamples in any degree. And any dimension, of course, degree greater than or, e e or equals three and dimension greater than or, or equals uh, four, because otherwise it's not possible to produce counterexamples. Of course, is if the number of x, oh no. Oops. Maybe I did something wrong. There is someone fixing my issues. Thank you. Um, notice that if the number of x variables, which is n plus one in my notation, since I start in, in x zero, xn, so n plus one variables x and m, 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 m variables u. If the number, if the number of x variables is greater than the number of u variables, then they are automatically Algebraically dependent because there will be more forms than the number of variables g. So automatically it implies the vanishing of the Hessian. That was actually the case in the original Esempio Semplicissimo by Perazzo. Perazzo also constructed a series of cubic hypersurfaces in this way. He was actually dealing only with cubes. We, we just uh, named this more general hypersurface, Perazzo hypersurface, in homage to his work, but he was actually working only with cubic hypersurfaces. And he proved that uh, uh, these are all the cubic hypersurface with vanishing Hessian in PN for n equals four, five, and six. So the classification of cubes with vanishing Hessian. Also, we 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 understand the, the, the geometry of such hypersurface. So the classification of hypersurface with vanishing Hessian. 
of degree three is closed up to P6. And there is some, some results in, in P7, but after that, it begins to be a little bit more confusing to try to deal with a, a, a general result of classification. In the last lecture, I will say something about it. It will be more clear to what, what are the problems for qubits. In degree d greater than or equals four, it's totally open for a greater than or equals five. To try to cut a classification in any degree, but in P4, Gordoneta constructed uh, lots of different families, as I said before. And this family is called permuti polynomial. It's a simplification of the original Gordoneta family. Um, it's made in this way. We take R in the same way, a polynomial ring with separated variables, the variables X from zero to N and the variables U from one to N and let the Q to be a Perazzo form, a Perazzo polynomial. And take forms of the right degree in order to construct a homogeneous polynomial, taking powers of in other words, let G the polynomial coefficients in another variable, let me say T. It's a new indeterminate and G is something like that. Coefficients J, J, and zero to. And in order to make it a homogeneous polynomial, the degree of the J is T minus J E where E is the degree of the original Perazzo form. So F, G, and Q, except for multi. Polynomial of type N, the number of U variables, N, the number of its variables, E, the degree of the original Perazzo uh, polynomial that will be put inside G. So the Perazzo polynomials are kind of the building blocks of the classical uh, 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 constructions of forms with finishing hash. And the proposition 
these guys, these are multi-polynomials, they have an issue in Hessian. They are not called uh, the proof, it's just to compute the, the derivative of f using the chain rule here. times the derivative of q. And since g prime is, is, is the same in all of the partial derivatives of f with respect to the variables x, and since by hypothesis q is a parallel polynomial, so these are algebraically dependent, it implies that the derivatives at xi are also algebraically dependent. Therefore, the Hessian is vanishing. Again, it's not an easy computation, but it's not difficult. It's just boring to prove that, that actually um, the, 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 all the derivatives of f are actually linearly independent. So the hypersurface defined by this form is not a cone, and um, they have they have vanishing Hessian, and as you can see. It's a huge family. It's not, it's, it includes, of course, Perazzo original construction, but it's richer. And the main result of Gordon and her paper is the following that if X is a reduced hypersurface, not a cone, and before having the missing Hessian, then uh, up to projective transformation, F is a permutipolynomial of type 2, 2E. So three variables X, two variables U, and degree E, mm. or some greater than or equal to three because it's a parallel polynomial. A, a geometric proof of these coordinate um, main result can be found in the Bagnati Ripeto and in chapter seven of Russo's book. Here, I, I do not have enough time to, to give a proof. It's a very long proof, but I'll try to give a proof of some previous results. Let me see how much time I have. I have enough time to, to prove some previous results. I will use these results with difficult to prove not difficult, uh, it's a long proof, but uh, it uh, says lots of things about the geometry of form with, with vanishing Hessian. In some things, this result is hidden in the, the, 
the work of Gordoneta mm, by the use of the so-called um, Gordoneta identity, which in modern uh, terms can be predefined to say something about the fibers of the polar map. Let me, this, this is the corollary of coordinator identity. Let X be a hypersurface with vanishing Hessian. So this result is telling us something about the, the structure, the geometric structure of hypersurface with vanishing Hessian, which allows us to, to try to, to, to describe geometrically and try to give a, a geometric, geometric uh, classification characterization of hypersurfaces with vanishing Hessian to try to classify, but the classification is only in some cases it's open. It's open in degree D or in greater than equal seven and uh, arbitrary degree for a greater than or equals five. So let X be a hypersurface with vanishing hash. I recall that the base locus of the polar map is the singular locus of x. So if if I take a point P in P A, but not in the singular locus of x, I can compute the polar image of this guy. Let's suppose that the point in P A is general enough in order to depolar image to be the regular part of the, the, polar, the polar image of P, P belongs to the regular part of the polar image of P A, then the, the first part of the corollary says that Mm. The linear is from the cone with vertex P over the dual of the tangent space of Z in phi P, which is actually a linear, a linear, a linear subspace of the projective space belongs to the belongs to the fiber of P, the fiber of the image of P. If P is general, the closure of the irreducible component of the fiber passing through P is actually this, this guy, this linear span of P in the dual of the tangent of Z in image of phi of P. In particular, for the general P, the, the fiber, the, the general fiber of the, the polar map is a union of linear spaces passing through 
the dual of the transient space of C infinite. And to finish, the dual of C is inside the sig of X. X is the original hypersurface with vanishing hash. And he is we can the set theoretical singular logs of X, which I'm saying that is huge. In fact, it contains the dual of the polar image. This is a very strong geometric consequence of vanishing Hessian. And I'm going to use this to explain The, the proof of the Gordon Vettel theorem in low dimension and to explain the geometry of Perazzo hypersurface in order, in order to, to, to give a geometric version of the, the Gordon Vettel classification in P4, not in general, but at least understanding Perazzo, Perazzo original example, it's enough to try to, to, to give you some insight about the, the, the general classification problem in P4. Let me start with the first case of order matter theorem. A equals to just to just to start. Is a curve a curve the punishing hash it's polar image. It's a curve. And the dual of the polar image is inside the single log of, of X, which I call Y. But since the dimension of X is one by generic smoothness, this guy has dimension zero. And since Z is, is an image of P2, it's irreducible. So the dual is also irreducible of dimension zero. It's a point. If the dual is a point, this guy must be alive. Therefore, assuming that X is irreducible, must be a line. 
Ale to je první. X sekund. Which is lines passing through a fixed point. I will not give all the details for the coordinator theorem in P3. But let me say something. Here in P2, one is in Hessian, a bicycle. More or less, not all the days. Between the rule that was the rule. The dual of the polar image is inside the singular locus of X. Let me put the dimension here to be two. It's always possible to restrict ourselves to this case. In the dimension two, I'm going to suppose what you, just to simplify the situation that x is irreducible, a, a, a irreducible uh, surface in B3. This dimension is one. So there are two possibilities. If the dimension described is zero, it's a point. Then Z is a plane. It implies that X has one in hash. In other case, is I mentioned, equals one. This is the general case. And we have to prove, we have to prove that um, we have to prove that Z is generated and here there are, there are different possibilities to give this proof. One possibility is Study the, the the dual of X, which is the image of the restriction of the polar map to X. The restriction of the polar map of a hypersurface is precisely the Gauss map of the hypersurface. In this case of a hypersurface, the Gauss map, the image of the Gauss map, so it's possible to study this dual to finish the proof or go inside the, 
the, the structure of the singular locus. It's not so easy. I'm not giving you the details, but here is some idea of the coordinate theorem using this geometric translation of the uh, actual work of Gordon Letter, which was much more algebraic and uh, with lots of uh, long computations. So these, these are the, the ideas. Okay, to finish the first lecture, I'm gonna go back to Perazzo example and try to describe completely the geometry of this particular example. And after that, um, try to, to, to explain how is the geometry of uh, every hypersurface in P4 with vanishing hashing. All the blackboard. So let's go back. Perazzo. Keep it four. Equations. I recall the calculation I did. So This is the algebraic relation of dependence among the partial derivatives. Here in my geometric diagram, it is actually the equations of the polar image. Of course, uh, we know that the polar image is inside the hypersurface, but it's not easy to see that in this particular case, the, the polar image is actually this hypersurface, which I will write uh, in the dual projected space with Capital letters, the variables, so it's minus y squared. So this hypersurface uh, does not depend on the variables u and v, so it's actually a cone with a vertex line. The cone, which cone? This cone. Here is the vertex. Sorry. Yes. X, Y, Z. The vertex is a line, and you can think projective coordinates in this line as to be U and V. And we have these. Plane in UV 
And here we can think the projective uh, uh, coordinates to be x, y, and z. And there is a conic here. This conic has equation x, z minus y squared inside the plane. U and V that we call this plane. Let me see. I'll call it N. N and V. By using <clears throat> that the B dual of the projective space is essentially. Same, we are working over C. So let me explore what's going on here in X. So Z is a cone, it's a cone that I can put it as the span between V. And C is actually Z, and uh, therefore X must be degenerated, and uh, sorry, Z dual must be degenerated inside the singular locus of X. The world is decelerated inside the dual of the vertex of Z. Let me call it V pair. It's a plane. It's a plane with coordinates. X, Y, and Z, and here there is a conic, which is essentially the dual of this conic and this guy is actually, of course, I know that this, this is Z dual, Z dual, Z, Z dual is inside the singular locus, and it's easy to see that the partial derivatives of F it's easy to see that F belongs to the square of the ideal U and V. So this plane is inside the singular links, the singular locks of X, and in fact it is the reduced structure of the singular locus. This plane in the, in the singular locus is, is, this, is, the, is the, the, the single rag, but Z dual is an embedded component of the schematic structure of the singular locus. Let me say something more. About the geometry of this particular example. So it's a plane in P4. And if I consider Consider the, the, the one dimensional family of hyperplanes in P4 that contain this guy, it's actually the dual of V. Sorry, if, if I consider the one dimensional, one dimensional family 
of hyperplanism before containing this guy. It's the dual of this guy, which is V. And let me put lambda here in the one dimensional family. Lambda V determines hyperplane H lambda before hyperplane that contains the V dual. Moreover, the V parametrizes the family, the one dimensional family of hyperplanes of before containing uh, V dual. Since X is a cube hypersurface in this plane appears with multiplicity two, intersect H with X, I got two times, let me call it, ah, what? Two times Y, yes, two times Y plus another plane. L lambda is a plane. But let me let me say something about this plane. If I take a point P. And if I want to understand the fibers of the polar map, I will see exactly this way. So take the one dimensional family, parametrize the bio V of hyperplanes in P4 containing this double plane inside X, we, we see that X is in fact this tangential scroll over the conic. Tangent. Over the conic, we can move the one dimensional family lambda, which is giving a point depending on lambda here. And X is the closure of the union of this place. In general, all. Uh, Hypersurface of before with vanishing Hessian can be constructed in such similar way. It sounds possible to understand the, 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 the dual of X, which is the scroll X dual, is the scroll S12 inside the cone. See, this cone is made taking all possible points here to all possible points in the conic, and this call is given by this parameter, which determines a point there, which determines the display, and it determines a point here, uh, depending on lambda. In, with this double parametrization, this is the scroll inside the cone. It's actually the X. All the hypersurface with vanishing has shown before share this particular geometry. 
they are kind of does it's called over curves with a plane inside the singular locus. Um, in, in, inside the plane, there is an embedded component of the schematic structure of the singular locus over which the tangents determine planes in such a way, tangent to the curve in such a way that it is a tangent scope over this plane curve and that will is some kind of skull inside a cone with vertex aligned over a plane curve, a rational plane curve, and giving a, 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 a simultaneous parametrization of the line and of the curve. We got the, the, the skulls, all these hypersurface we finished in Hashem before share this very particular geometry. And now it finishes the, the, the classical part. Let me just recall the very open problem of this first lecture, which is the classification of the reducible hypersurface of degree D greater than or equals three in PN with N greater than or equals five, not a cone, and having vanishing Hessian. In the cube case, the problem is closed uh, up to P6. So the problem is open from seven. And to summarize the ideas of the first lecture, it's my personal version <laughs> of the coordinator theory. There are lots of results included in the, the original coordinator uh, paper and also in subsequent works that some people call a coordinator theory, but I think that uh, should be nice to, 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 to think in these six results of uh, uh, the, the, the core of coordinator and subsequent results in the understanding of hypersurface with in Hessian. So the polar map and the polar image, an algebra geometric description of the meaning, the, the, the deep collapse, the deep con geometric consequences of the vanishing of the Hessian. Um, there is no examples if the dimension is low. There are counterexamples for Hess's claim and the degree and uh, the dimension is higher. Some kind of coordinator identity, which I did not have enough time to explain, but uh, the, the, this, this result Ups, 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 is a very strong consequence. And the classification in dimension n equals four. <clears throat> in the cycle, in the next lectures, I'm gonna uh, uh, introduce the, the, the Artinian Gorenstein algebras and use higher Hessians to try to construct some kind of higher order Gordon letter theory. So the, the next lectures are kind of a link with classical results of Gordon letter theory using 
the structure of Archean Gorstein algebras to, to, to introduce some kind of higher order Gordon letter theory, which is not totally, totally understood in, in general, but uh, in some parts it's okay. Let me just finish the, this first lecture and pointing out the main reference. Gauss' description in general circa superficie curvas was my motivation. Gordon letter is the main reference, but it's not easy to follow. Uh, Gilberto Russo seems was one of the first modern papers revisiting the, the, the original work and go beyond. Garpagnati Repeto includes a geometric proof of the main classification result of coordinate. Here we, we revisit Perazzo's original work. In this paper, we, we, we did some generalizations given um, other, other families of hypersurface with vanishing hash. Um, these, these have a very different geometric structure. Um, the, these are the two original papers of Hess, where he two wrong proofs of his wrong claim. Lawson is essentially uh, uh, a revisit of Gordon and their original work. Gordon letter proofs of Hess's claim. Perazzo is the original work of Perazzo, Permuti, series of papers. And this is the Russo's book on the geometry of some special projective rights, where in the chapter seven, uh, there are lots of results about Gordon letter theory and also the connections with Artin and Gorsten algebras. Segri, Benjamino Segri, it's the, the, the part of the develop of the hypersurface. But now with the bond, they also revisit uh, original work of coordinator. And that's it. This was my first lecture. Tomorrow, at the same time, I'm going to, to start to introducing uh, Artin and Gorenstein algebras to link the classical Hessian theory with the theory of higher order Hessians and try to try to put a higher order Gordon theory. Thank you.